Hello, I'm Jay Smith, Senior Pastor at State Street United Methodist Church. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this service of worship. If you do not have a church home, I want to invite you to join us in person each Sunday morning at 8.08 and 10 a.m. We're located at the corner of State and 11th Streets in Bowling Green. And you can also find us on our website at www.statestreetumc.org. And now may you be blessed by this service of worship. You have made us all part of your family. Help us to welcome each person who enters here as part of that family, even if they do not look like us, talk like us, dress like us, or even believe exactly as we do. Help us to see one another as you see us, not perfect, but forgiven. If we stop to consider this great gift of adoption into your family, we are overwhelmed by your acceptance of us. Far too often, we act as if the relationship with you is our prerogative, as if we somehow do you a favor by participating in it, instead of acknowledging the enormous gift of your grace, which even makes it possible. As amazing as it is that we can invite you into our lives, it is even more astounding that you have invited us into yours. Just like those first disciples, we do not fully understand. We do not always do those things that you have clearly asked of us. Forgive us, God, for all of the ways, big and small, that we just try to fit you into our lives rather than making you the center of it. Forgive us, we pray, God, and lead us into joyful obedience. We pray today for all of those whose daily struggles threaten to overwhelm them, whether those be financial, medical, occupational, or even just basic survival. We ask that you would meet each of those needs and give us your strength to carry on. We ask that you especially be with the firefighters who even this day battle tremendous blazes which threaten lives and livelihoods. We ask a special blessing on our teachers, school staff, and students as they have gone back to begin a new school year. We pray that our schools will be places of peace and security, of learning and growing. We pray that you will help those who love you show that love to others and be a blessing to all they meet in their classrooms, their cafeteria, in the hallway, on the playground, wherever they may find themselves. We ask that you would help each of us to share your love and invite others into the relationship with you that we enjoy so that your family might grow. And we thank you for your son, our brother, and our savior, Jesus who not only showed us the way, but became the way for us. It is in his holy and matchless name that we pray together the prayer he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for us to return to God a portion of what God has already blessed us with. So I invite our ushers to come forward at this time to receive God's tithes and our offerings. If you have a loose change, hang on to that for just a few more minutes. We'll be gathering that soon.
Dear Lord, we give you our praise and our thanks for all the blessings we have received. We are so grateful to be beneficiaries of the wonderful world that you've made for us. We rejoice that we're privileged to have relatives and friends and co-workers and neighbors and a cloud of witnesses in our church. We sometimes forget the extent of our relationship to all the peoples of the world. We must never forget that we are all under your fatherhood. We've been charged with loving and caring for each other. We ask that you would use these gifts to help care for our brothers and sisters in need. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I invite all the kids to come down front, and if you have brought your backpack, bring that. And today, if you would, find a place along the altar rail, somewhere on one of these cushions on the front, okay? And we'll bless these backpacks this morning. It, there's some spots right down there. Oops, Ooh, that's for later. Preview. You guys just stand down there by Jake. Huh? Awesome. All right, Gus, come on down here by Jake. Would you do that? Helen, would you come on down here? All right, so everybody start back to school this week. Yes. So, can anybody tell me in a word what school was? School is what? Great. Awesome. Fun. Fun. Oh, great. School is what, Jake? Okay. School is? School rocks. What do you have to say? We had homework on the first day of school. Oh, homework on the first day, that's rough. We got to start learning, packing those brains full of information. Okay, well, Jesus reminds us that whatever's going on, whether it's something good and awesome or just okay, that God is with us and God is blessing us in every single moment. And so today... We're going to bless these backpacks, and Ethan, would you help me with this part? We're going to make sure everybody gets a backpack tag and a blessing page. So I need you to unzip your backpacks, and when we come around, we're going to put these in your bags. Would you take a handful and do that? All right, everybody get your backpacks ready. Ethan and I are going to come around and make sure everybody gets a blessing tag. We're going to slip these right inside. It makes it easier to keep up with. Have you got yours from last year? Now you can have two. All right, here's one for you. This year's tag is a little different from last year's tag for those of you who still have last year's. This year's tag says, blessed are you. And it's a reminder that God is with us all the time when things are just okay, when things are not so okay, and when things are really great and fun and awesome. All right, everybody on that side have one? All right, one for you, one for you, one for you. All right, does everybody have one now? We're going to say a blessing prayer for these backpacks. And after the prayer, I want you to sit tight because we have one more important job to do this morning. All right, let's pray. I'll pray this time for each of you, okay? Dear God, 
We thank you for these students. We thank you for their schools. We thank you for their teachers. We thank you for all the things that you have planned for them to learn this year. We pray that you will use these backpacks to hold their books, to hold their lunches, to hold wonderful messages from you. We pray that you will help them to be good learners, and that you will bless them each and every day that they are in school. We thank you for the blessing that they are to us, and we pray that you will help them to remember to be a blessing to others as they go. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, boys and girls, so if you will put your backpacks on the cushion in front of you, we're going to leave them right there for a minute because we need your help with another important project. Is Miss Cindy here? Miss Cindy? There she is. All right, I need you guys to listen up. It looks like we have more children than we have buckets. So I would like for some of you older children to make sure you take a younger one along with you. And uh, maybe if we can have a few start in the very back and a few start in the middle and a few start in the front, we can make a joyful noise and uh, help provide food for children on the weekends that don't usually have food on the weekends. And I, you just don't know how heartwarming you all are for us. Just the idea that we know that when you go home on the weekends, you have people that are interested in what's inside your backpack, and you'll have food to eat, and you're just such a blessing to us and to others. And your Joyful Noise collection is a way to show that. Thank you so much. Like, let's get some buckets and Right. Alex, can you find a buddy?
Have we got all our buckets back? Awesome job, everybody. Thank you all so much. Let's bless this offering, and then we'll go to Children's Church, all right? Grab your backpacks. Let's have a prayer. This one I would love for you to help me with, okay? Would you say this one with me? Dear God. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing us. So that we can be a blessing to others. So that we can be a blessing to others. Please use these gifts. Please use these gifts. To help children. To help children. Not be hungry. Not be hungry. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to Children's Church. Most of us have heard the expression, Jesus is the answer, which is certainly true. Jesus is the answer, I believe, to life's deepest longings. But you may or may not have known that Jesus asked in the Gospels over a hundred questions. And so we're considering what it means for Jesus to be not the answer, but the question. And we're looking at these series of messages, some of the questions that Jesus asked his disciples and that others who are gathered around him in those teaching times. Today we continue with a scene where Jesus is teaching in a home, we're not sure whose home, but he has a crowd gathered around him and his mother and brothers come looking for him, his family. And they're prompted to ask Jesus uh, to come and see them and Jesus raises an important question when he finds out his mother and brothers are looking for him. This story is recorded in Mark chapter three, verses 31 to 35. For those of you who are able, let us stand together and honor the reading of the gospel. Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus asked, Who are my mother and my brothers? Then Jesus looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother 
and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. There is no biblical evidence recorded of what Mary, Jesus' mother's response was when she was told that Jesus was not coming out to greet her. Mary's reaction is not recorded, but I have only wondered through the years why she seems, what she would have said, what appears to be a snub to her request to see her son. Did you tell him we were out here? Yes, ma'am. Did you tell him we want to see him? Yes, ma'am. Did you tell him his mother wants to see him? Yes, ma'am. What did he say? Ma'am, he, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he said, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He said, what? He said, those who do God's will are my mother and brother. I tell you what, you go back in there and you tell him his mother is out here to see him. I brought him into this world, and you know the rest. <laughs> I mean, what is going on? It's an interesting exchange that Jesus has. His mother and his brother, his family, his kin have come to speak with him. I mean, surely Jesus knows what we all know. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, what is he doing? Is Jesus against his family? Is Jesus against the family? I don't know about you, but I thought the church was supposed to be about family values. I thought the church was to be about the family. And Jesus, in this exchange, He is downright rude to his very own mother and brothers. What's Jesus doing? What is Jesus up to? Well, Jesus is not against family, and Jesus doesn't want us to be against our families either. I don't think that's what he's up to here. If you had or have a loving mother and father, then thank God for that. If you have or had brothers and sisters who did not live out of jealousy and petty sibling rivalry, but were able to rejoice with you in your successes and ache with you in your times of disappointment, Jesus doesn't want to take that away from you. Thank God for that. If you are or were married and your spouse was sensitive and caring, always careful never to put you down in front of others, attentive and intentional to build you up and to help you be everything God would want you to be. Jesus doesn't want to take that away from you. If you happen to be a family of one and have been blessed with a network of loving and supportive friends, Jesus isn't down on your family of one. Friends, if you have a healthy, loving, nurturing family, Jesus rejoices with you. This passage is not a passage against any good family. However, what Jesus is doing here, I suggest to you, Jesus is forcing us to realize that following him, having a relationship with him, has an effect, an often ripple effect, on every other relationship in our lives, even and especially family relationships. You see, when we take seriously our relationship with Jesus Christ, watch out, because all previous and current relationships will want to know, where do I fit in? Where do I come into the equation now? Now, I want to quickly say that I'm not talking about a sick or unhealthy following of Jesus that can often cause strain in a relationship in in the family. I've known people in places I've served. I've known folks, and they're at the church all the time. And initially, you think, this is wonderful. Helen is at the church all the time. Helen is a wonderful follower of Jesus. And then you realize Helen is hiding out at the church. Helen is at the church because Helen doesn't want to face 
her husband, or her kids, or her parents. I'm not talking about hiding out with Jesus at the church. And this can be done by clergy or clergy families. Any of us who are professional Christians, we have to be on guard that we are serving Jesus and following Jesus not in a way that harms our family. I'm talking about a sincere and genuine obedience to God in Christ that often inevitably will have ramifications on our family. Some of you, I don't know all of you, but some of you, some of you here today, your wonderful spouses, your wonderful parents, your wonderful children or youth, and yet, when you leave home, when you left home this morning to come to State Street, you left someone in your family at home by his or her own choice. And sometimes the jabs begin. Sometimes the, the prick begins as you walk out the door. I don't get into all that church stuff. You have a good time. I'll see you when you get back. Bunch of hypocrites anyway. Think they're better than everybody else. I don't go for all that church stuff. Some of you, some of you know what the guilt trips are like. Some of you know that every mistake that you make gets magnified. Well, I, did they teach you how to argue like that in Sunday school? You did go to Sunday school last Sunday. I guess that's, they teach arguing now in Sunday school? Well now, aren't you, aren't you a good little Christian? You're going to tell the reverend, you're going to tell the reverend this Sunday how that little cuss word slipped out? Every mistake, every shortcoming gets magnified. There are some people here this morning who when they turned to Christ, they knew full well that they would be turning away from some people in their own family. And I don't care who you are, that is painful. It hurts every time. Some years ago now, I was serving in another district, and I would take out to the Navajo Reservation, the Four Corners Native American Ministry. I took a group of youth from that area out to Four Corners two summers in a row, and we built, helped build a church one summer, and then we helped build a fellowship hall, and Evelyn was the pastor of that church she was a Navajo woman, and she shared with us with tears in her eyes, she shared with us that when she turned to Christ, everybody in her family disowned her. And I don't have to share with you that some of that we have to own as Christians because years ago, if we wanted to reach a Navajo person, we took away the drums, we took away everything that was cultural or anything that they had related to God in any way and it was taken from they weren't even allowed to speak their language and so some of that friends frankly is on us but it's a painful thing Evelyn said I am dead to my family because I follow Jesus some of us cannot relate to that some of us can't relate to the pastor in the Madisonville area when I was superintendent there he was telling me about his call to ministry and he said I was in a family business with my father and we were working side by side and I knew God was calling me into the ministry and I knew I'm gonna to have to tell him that I'm gonna leave the family business and I've got to go to seminary I've got to follow God's call on my life and he said he finally got enough courage to tell his father that he was going to have to leave the family business and he was going to seminary he was following God's call on his life and he said his father said to him if you leave do not come back and he fired him right on the spot who who are my mother and who are my brothers and who are my sisters? Jesus suggests that, that our true family, a family that we didn't ask for, but a family that we are invited into, may not be related 
to our relatives. Jesus, hear me, Jesus does not tolerate or ask any of us to endure abuse in the name of family. Jesus doesn't ask any child to stay in a home where that child is mistreated in the name of you need to honor your father and your mother. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't ask any woman or any man in a marital relationship to be subjected to emotional or physical abuse over and over in the interest of marriage is sacred and divorce is frowned upon in the Bible. Jesus doesn't ask any person. He asks no one to be taken advantage of in the name of family. Jesus doesn't ask us, that family member who has an addiction or is struggling in some way, looking for ways to pay for their problem. Jesus doesn't invite us into that relationship in a way that would mistreat us or abuse us. Some brother, you are. Give to the church, don't you? Real generous with the church, giving to this, giving to that. You won't even help your own flesh and blood. Some Christian, you are. Won't even help your own brother. But you know, you know, if you give the money, if you give the help, the help will hurt. It won't help. And it's a painful thing. Jesus doesn't ask us to endure or tolerate any mistreatment in the name of family. Jesus redefines family. Jesus says, you have a family, whether their DNA or blood is running through your veins or not. You have a mother and you have brothers and you have sisters. And no matter what kind of family you came out of, this is a family where you are loved and accepted. This is family. I served with uh, Dr. John Kirst. Some of you may know Dr. John. He was a retired United Methodist pastor. God rest his soul. And he was on staff at the Crestwood Church when I went there to be pastor many years ago. And Dr. John was a wonderful soul, wonderful spirit. He would walk with a cane. He'd come out on Sunday morning and he would take the cane and he would do a Bob Hope imitation. He'd do a golf swing with that cane. Just marvelous spirit, wonderful spirit. And he he told me this, we were baptizing someone in the service one day, and this was an expression he used, I've never forgot it. He said, Jay, remember, water is thicker than blood. The waters of baptism, that's what he was talking about, the waters of baptism are thicker than blood. The waters of baptism trump blood. The waters of baptism are stronger than blood type. They're stronger than gene pools. They're stronger than DNA. The water is thicker. Thicker than blood. Several years ago now, uh, a friend of mine said to me probably what was one of the nicest things he anybody's ever said to me. I get a lot of things said to me. And this particular friend, we were best friends in college. He was the person that I told, the very first person I told when I was accepting my call to ministry. And we were in the dorm there at Kendall Hall at Kentucky Wesleyan College, and he was the first person that I shared this news with. He was already serving some churches I looked up to him. We were best friends. I knew a lot about him. I knew a lot about his strained relationships in his own family with his mother and his father and his two brothers and sisters. And I, I knew some of the dysfunction, some of the bitterness, some of the hurt and strain through the years. And, and I got word. My parents actually called me and they said, uh, I don't know if you heard, but uh, Ricky's, I said earlier in the first service, his father, it was actually his mother. His mother had passed. His father had died many years before. And so they told me that there was going to be a service for his 
his, his mother, and you know how it is. You kind of lose touch. You kind of drift away from persons that you're close to. And, but I was determined, I'm going to go to the service. And, and I did. It was about three hours, and I got on the road and got away a little late and got there not in time when the service had already started. And so I just slipped into that little funeral home in the back, and I slipped on the, the back pew. The back pews are more comfortable, aren't they? And I slipped into that funeral home, and I took my place. He wasn't aware I was even there in the service. They held the service, and after the service, I slipped out to my car and got in the procession to go to the cemetery, and it wasn't until after the graveside service there, as the family was milling about and kind of making their way away from the grave, that we finally made eye contact. He didn't know I was there, and he came over, and, and he hugged me. And he said to me what is probably the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. He said, Jay, you, uh, you have been more of a brother to me than any of my own family. And I love you for that. And I hugged him back and I said, uh, I said, Rick, water is thicker than blood. I believe that, and I love you too. Those of us who are very comfortable in church, those of us like myself who grew up in the church, and the church is the air that we breathe, the church is the life that we live, sometimes we can forget, we can forget that the most profound thing that God does through the church is to make us into a family. And just like any family, we fight sometimes and we disagree sometimes and we're up and we're down. And yet there is this tenacity that God's grace gives to us to shape us and to form us into a family. And we should never take that for granted because the world is hurting for a sense of community, a sense of being part of a family where love and acceptance reign. If you don't believe that, watch the news later. There will be demonstrations or there will be people who even today, because of the color of somebody's skin or their status in society, whether their education level or what they make, will be treated unfairly. Some people... Don't be naive. Some people do not want a family within the world. They don't want what the choir was singing. Gather us in all creeds and all colors. Gather us in and the fancy and the plain. There's a lot of folks in the world today that don't want that. That makes our needing to represent that even greater in the world today. Some of you might be thinking, that noisy, that noisy offering, those cans, that was kind of, what was that about? That was about the fact that we believe that any child who doesn't have food on the weekend is our responsibility. That's our child. We don't ever say, well, not my kid, not my problem. Uh-uh. So these noisy cans, they remind us that every child in this community, if we have a way to help, we're determined to do it. Why? Because God has offered us this family that we're a part of. And the invitation is not just for us, but it's for any and all. Who in here can name everybody else in here? Look around. I want to give you a few seconds. Anybody? Any, can anybody name? I don't want to show off. I can name everybody in here. And you can too. Brother? Sister? And you might think that's cheating, but that's the gospel. You knew everybody's name and didn't even know it. And I did too. Let us pray.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of this church family, for the gift of your family on this earth that you call us to be in relationship. We thank you that you have created us and every human being in your very image. And you seek to recreate us in Christ Jesus. You seek to shape us through the power of your Holy Spirit into a family, into a new creation so that we might be a blessing not just to ourselves but to this community and to the world that you came to save in Christ Jesus. Oh God, we thank you for every sister and every brother who is with us in this holy place this day. Help us to extend that invitation to others that do not know what it means to be part of a family. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. He is our brother and he is our friend. And all God's sisters and brothers did say, Amen. I invite you to stand for our hymn of discipleship. It is number 557 in your red hymnal, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. My sisters and brothers, you go from this place and just know that there are a lot of people in the world that you will meet and that I will meet who do not yet know that they are part of God's family. And it's up to us to share that great news. Do it with joy and do it with love and kindness to the glory of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and all God's sisters and brothers did say,